When a liquid takes on a solid form, it's an almost magical transformation. Rain falling as snow charms adults and children alike. Snowflakes fascinate with their complex symmetrical patterns. Yet it's not uncommon. 15% of the Earth's surface is covered by snow and ice. This frozen world forms part of the Earth's cryosphere. The term describes the portions of the Earth's surface where water is in solid form. It includes snow, sea ice, glaciers, frozen lakes and rivers, and the ice caps. There is so much ice that if it were all to melt, global sea level would rise by 65 meters. That's not likely to happen anytime soon, yet all over the world, ice is melting. Glaciers are particularly vulnerable, especially at the margins of their existence. Climate change is affecting most glaciers um, quite considerably. Uh, surface runoff is increasing, the ice is retreating, and the ice is also thinning. Himalayan glaciers feeding the headwaters of the Ganges in India and glaciers feeding the Yellow River in China are retreating. Glaciers in the European Alps have lost around half their volume since the start of the 19th century. And in 1910, North America's Glacier National Park had 150 glaciers. Today, it has less than 30. And of course, that water flows back into the global ocean, and the result of that is global sea level rise. And of course, what we're seeing in the global sea level record is that sea level is rising faster than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Sea level has risen 20 centimetres in the past century. There's one main culprit, heat. In that time, the Earth's temperature has risen by an average of three quarters of a degree Celsius according to the IPCC, a panel of the world's top climate scientists. There is no denying, fire and ice don't mix. The Scott Polar Research Institute, based in Cambridge in the UK, is a world centre for the study of the polar regions. Global climate models predict that change over the entire Earth in terms of temperature may be as much as a few degrees over the next 50 to 100 years. But all those models also suggest that the Arctic temperature will increase much more than lower latitudes. Average temperatures in the Arctic have increased by almost twice the global figure. It's a phenomenon known as positive feedback and may lead to an accelerating rise in Arctic temperatures. In the sea, we have floating sea ice, which is very, very reflective. If that forms a little bit less year to year, we have a little bit more of open ocean in the Arctic basin exposed. And that open ocean is not very reflective, it's actually very dark. And that, in turn, changes the energy balance at the sea surface. So it's not just that the global climate is changing by a degree, two degrees, three degrees. It's actually that there's a positive feedback in addition to that which enhances the change. A warming Arctic is having far-reaching consequences. Melting snow is seeping into the ground as water and then refreezing, turning it rock hard, making it difficult for reindeer to forage for food. The livelihoods of indigenous people who depend on reindeer suffer in turn. Meanwhile, the world of the polar bears is literally dissolving beneath them. In the western Hudson Bay, the population has declined by 22% over the past 20 years. Without sea ice, the bears cannot hunt for seals. And with greater distances to swim between the ice flows, the bears drown. However, the receding sea ice is expected to bring big profits too, facilitating oil and gas exploration and opening new shipping lanes. The Earth's last frontier may well become a new Klondike, as petrochemical companies race to exploit its mineral resources. There may also be changes to the living world. As the oceans warm, some fish species are migrating northwards. 
In an effort to understand these trends, the Norwegian Ministry of Fisheries spends 40% of its budget on research. Jorn Korg is the general secretary. We have seen during the last years a more northern um, migration of, of um, pelagic stocks like the mackerel, the blue whiting, which is a, which is a great, uh, great stock in the, uh, in the Norwegian Sea, has migrated northwards. They are estimated more than one million tons of that species in the Barents Sea. Five, ten years ago there was only minor quantities to, to be observed. Key to protecting the northern fish stocks is a sound management policy both within Norway and with neighbouring countries such as Russia. And the evidence is that the cod stock in, in our waters is the, beside the Icelandic cod stock, the only two left in the world being, being managed in a way which has been sustainable. The first fishermen to exploit Arctic waters were whalers hunting for their oil. Their base, the Arctic island archipelago of Svalbard, and its main island, Spitsbergen. Early accounts from the seamen spoke of finding so many whales, it was almost impossible to pass through the water. Two centuries on, the slaughter of over 120,000 whales led to one entire species, the Greenland right whale, being hunted almost to extinction. Today, coal mining is big business on Svalbard. Svalbard's largest settlement, Longyearbyen, is named after the American miner who opened the first profitable mine in 1906. Niels Tokheim is a director of the mining company Store Norse. The coal seam is from here down to here, it's about one and a half meter. And here the, the seam, the coal seam is starting. You, you can clearly see the difference. We call it black gold. The coal prices at the moment, uh, they are comfortably high, so... Uh, oh, really? Yes, they are. Good. Over three million tons of coal are exported every year. However, getting it to market is not always possible. The port is only ice-free for just a few months each year. Well, being uh, the, the northernest mine in the world, uh, you should think, uh, and being in the Arctic, you should think that we have a lot of disadvantages. Actually, we, we do have one big disadvantage, and that is the ice, which prevents us from shipping uh, seven months a year. That's our uh, the problem. The impact of global warming melting the Arctic ice may well lead to increased opportunities for coal and mineral extraction. Well, it, it would make it easier because uh, it will uh, expand the shipping season and that um, means we would have not have to store coal for s such a long time, which is uh, quite expensive. Uh, so that, that would uh, help us. Coal may be big business on Svalbard, but the profits from potential Arctic oil and gas reserves could be enormous. As the ice melts, the scramble to gain rights to this wealth has begun. The United States Geological Survey believes the Arctic may contain 25% of the world's remaining oil reserves. This is on top of the already massive Arctic gas fields. Cutting-edge technologies such as subsea platforms that avoid the worst of the Arctic weather have enabled the exploitation of the world's most northerly gas reserves. Development of the Russian Stockman and Norwegian Snorvit gas fields were initially rejected due to the extreme Arctic conditions, but are now almost completely operational. But will global warming bring any special difficulties to production in the Arctic? Arvid Jensen is the chairman of Petro Arctic, a company delivering goods and services to the oil and gas industry. The difficulties can be uh, changes uh, following or melting of ice. Uh, icebergs can be a problem. Big icebergs moving uh, down in the Barents Sea, uh, and, and uh, this, is, this can be a new situation for, for uh, oil and gas industry and industry in general. Increased numbers of large icebergs could pose a problem for underwater pipes taking oil and gas from wellheads in the Arctic. 
If they are ruptured by an iceberg, the oil spill would have serious consequences for wildlife in the region. Norwegian oil companies follow strict environmental regulations to safeguard against any spillage in their territorial waters. And in the north, there are especially strict uh, requirements because uh, the authorities don't want any pollution to the sea. And, uh, and uh, today, uh, the oil companies fulfill uh, these requirements. Without a comprehensive Arctic treaty, can all the oil companies be trusted to follow suit? Or will the rush for Arctic oil mirror the tragedy of the early whalers? The Arctic is surrounded by five countries. Norway, Greenland, linked to Denmark, Canada, Russia and the US. All of whom have, over the past few hundred years, made agreements and harboured unresolved disputes over rights to the Arctic. With no general Arctic treaty to arbitrate competing claims, most countries refer to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Under the treaty, a country's territorial waters reach 12 miles off the coast. But countries are allowed a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. It gives them fishing and exploitation rights. However, some countries are looking to gain even larger areas. Some states had continental shelves extending from their, from their land area way beyond 200 miles. They wanted to have access to resources because they argued that so long as they could get the technology to ex exploit, they should be able to exploit it beyond the 200 miles. In 2001, Russia submitted a claim to an extension of its continental shelf outside the 200-mile exclusive economic zone to include the Lomonosov Ridge. Canada and Denmark, through its union with Greenland, are submitting a counterclaim. Whoever is successful, the resulting exclusive economic zone could extend for 1,800 kilometres across the entire Arctic, from Canada and Greenland in the southwest to Siberia in the northeast, right past the North Pole. It will give rights to a huge area of potential oil, gas and fish resources. Determining the validity of the claims will rely on an unholy mix of science and politics. Copenhagen, capital city of Denmark and home to the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. Trina Dahl Jensen is one of the lead scientists from the Lomonosov Ridge mapping project. Her team, working in conjunction with the Canadians, is charged with finding out whether the Lomonosov Ridge is joined to the Canadian Greenland continental shelf. This is the basis of their claim to an extension of their exclusive economic zones. What we do need to argue and to prove is the, the connection in, onto Greenland and Canada. And what we're looking for here is to look at the deep structure down to several tens of kilometres down beneath the surface of the Earth. To prove their claim, the team need to show that the rock types of the ridge are the same as those of the continental shelf. You make a sound, a big bang, and we do it by explosions, and then rec you record how that sound travels through the earth for many hundreds of kilometers. The rock type is determined by the time taken for the sound waves to travel through it. So, three, two, one. That was a good one. I felt that one. Oh, that was a good one. The experiments have to be carried out in daylight and on the ice, which limits the scientists to just six weeks in a year when they can work. It is cold. I mean, this is an area where some, probably some of the harshest ice conditions that exist on the planet, even the, the big Russian nuclear icebreakers have uh, reservations about working in this area. The instruments have to be kept warm in freezer boxes. All our instruments, all 150 of them, were packed in insulating boxes. And the best insulating box you can buy is a picnic cooler. And then we pack them full of uh, ice packs to keep our instruments warm. And that sounds very, very weird indeed. But the point is that we pack them with thawed ice packs. And they keep the temperature in the box at about two or three degrees below zero. Instead of they going to minus 40 immediately, which kills a battery within hours. The data is still being analysed. Under the UN law of the sea, Canada and Denmark have a limited time by which they must submit their claim. 
if you have ratified the convention, you then have 10 years to prove this natural prolongation. And that's what we are doing. And that's what the Arctic nations are doing. Of course, all countries will uh, try to get as much as possible. And then they'll make up the principles afterwards. <laughs> It is not only exploitation rights that are in dispute. For 500 years, explorers have searched for a sea route over the Arctic linking Europe with Asia. The Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen was the first to make it through in 1906, but the ice was so thick it took him three years to complete the journey. In 2001, a team of Irish sailors completed the passage in just 24 days. The viability of the passage as a commercial shipping lane is now thought to be close. It's quite likely, uh, given the, the melting of, of the ice in the Arctic, in fact, that there will be an uh, open sea line sometime in the near future. Already the sea ice is melting and it's possible now for ships to go through. And certainly from a, a navigational and economic point of view, it would be very advantageous because it would mean that ships would no longer have to take detours through the Panama Canal. Named after the pioneering Arctic explorer, the Canadian icebreaker Amundsen is surveying the Northwest Passage. With the possibility of the route opening to commercial traffic, Canada and the US are disputing who controls the sea lane. The Canadian government weren't able to provide us with a spokesperson, but Louise de Lafayette worked as an advisor to the Canadian government on ocean issues and is now working as an international lawyer. Canada claims that the sea area between its islands are internal waters. That is, no ship of any foreign state has a right to sail through those waters without permission. The UN Law of the Sea provides an exception to this rule, whereby if internal waters are used as an international shipping lane, then other countries have rights of transit passage through these territorial waters. Well, I think it's important that, uh, that uh, w wherever it is, uh, throughout the world, uh, that uh, countries be able to use the seas uh, for, for free passage, for innocent passage. And I think it's important to, to international trade, it's important to the international community that straits like this be used, again, for transit. Canada argues that the Northwest Passage is not a straight use bank for international navigation because until recently only one or two ships have gone through. And uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not Canada versus the U.S., it's really Canada versus the rest of the world. Uh, we're not disputing, uh, the U EU is not disputing, the United States is not disputing uh, the sovereignty to these lands by Canada or the mineral rights. Uh, or the fishing, uh, fishing rights. All we're saying is the Northwest Passage is straight for international navigation. <laughs> Some fear the U.S. objections to Canadian control of the Northwest Passage may have more to do with Canada's strict environmental controls rather than the possibility Canada will refuse the U.S. the right of passage. Now, at the moment, Canada does exercise special control over ships going through the Arctic because in, in, 19, in 1971 Canada uh, enacted the Arctic Waters P Pollution Prevention Act which the Americans objected to. It imposed very strict uh, controls from an environmental point of view uh, over ships going, going through the Arctic up to a limit of, of 100 miles. The United States at that time expressed its uh, it's problems with the act, and that's been well stated, and, uh, and again, that's another area where we've agreed to disagree with now for some three decades. Satellite data since 1979 shows that the extent of the average summer Arctic sea ice has been shrinking by 9% per decade. As the ice melts, time is running out on settling long-standing disputes over Arctic exploitation rights and access to sea lanes. The repercussions, however, will not be limited to this, the Earth's last frontier. The polar regions to many people may seem a long way away and may not seem uh, very relevant to what happens um, at, at lower latitudes. But in fact, the global climate system is very much a linked system. The pieces, whether they're at high or low latitudes, all do fit together. If we do 
have enhanced melting on glaciers, of glaciers and ice sheets over the next 100 years. That will affect sea level on a global scale and therefore the port cities of the world will feel effects that originated high up at Arctic and Antarctic latitudes.